Hey folks, welcome back. So in this video, I'm addressing an email I got. And basically, one of my followers uh, belongs to a club and they had a fly in and they started talk. He started talking to this guy that flew a large model airplane. And if you're one of my longtime followers, you know, I'm obsessed with large model aircraft. And I'll get into that in a minute. But he found out this plane weighed 62 pounds. And he says, oh, do you have the AMA waiver? And the guy's like, no, I just tell everybody it's under 55 pounds. And he just didn't really see anything. So he reached out and says, you know, Dag, what do you think about a person who's breaking those rules? What do you think the ramifications are if something goes wrong? So that's kind of what I'm going to address here. So let's get this going. I know a lot of my videos are chatty, um, but I'm going to just call this the big RC planes uh, over 55 pound video. Okay. So the the thing is, is that um, the best way I can describe the over 55 pound is, as we all know, over the last four or five years, we've all been scared the government was going to regulate model aircraft to the point we couldn't enjoy it. A long time ago, the AMA knew that the government would always want to regulate us. And they created an over 55 pound to basically say, if your model aircraft is over 55 pound, you have to prove at a higher level that it's safe to fly and that you are a proficient pilot to fly it. Okay, so that's what this video is going to be about. And let's uh, get it going, okay? So if you're a new follower to my channel, I love giant scale model aviation. I love to design, build, and fly my own designs. Or if I'm making like a C-130, it's from my own CAD drawings I created. Or a B-36, my own CAD drawings I created. So my obsession is giant scale airplanes. So I, I think I know a little bit about flying giant airplanes. Uh, real quick shout out to one of my sponsors, RTL Fasteners. If you need bolts, nuts, servo screws, metric, standard, blind nuts, anything at all, um, and you need it kind of in more of a bolt quantity than buying eight of them at a time, um, they are the people to go to. And I always joke that I'm nuts about <laughs> RTL Fasteners. But um, if you go to the website and you buy more than $50 worth of product and you use code DA30, you'll get 30% off your order. <clears throat> so here I am standing by my MSL2. This is a giant electric airplane I built, 188 inch wing, um, and it weighs 61 pounds. So I had to get the AMA waiver, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But something I want people to understand about the over 55 pounds. The government will always try to regulate us for some reason, okay? And, and I, I kind of get it, but they need to leave model aviation alone because we do not nearly have the accidents that other hobbies have, okay? And, but there are some people that break, like, laws. They fly an airplane into restricted airspace or they go someplace. So the government does need to look at us, okay? I get that. But we don't want them to over-regulate us. And the AMA knew a long time ago that we needed to regulate big airplanes because we knew people were going to build them and we wanted them to be part of AMA. We just don't want somebody to build a 100-pound airplane and go out and fly it because there might be things they can learn from other modelers. There might be things that we can help them understand to make that plane fly safely. Okay? So, the and, and the over 55 pounds has been around for a long time. Now, they changed the maximum from 100 pounds up to 125 pounds uh, 10 or so years back. I can't remember how long that ago that was. But the moment the model airplane becomes over 55 pounds, we, I, I agree with this, but the AMA wanted to say, look, you got to prove to us that you can build a plane that big and make all the servos work and all of that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But you also need to show that you're proficient in flying a big airplane. So one of the things that I don't think people quite understand is... You know, when you look at like this picture of my MSL flying by, I got to be honest, the audience is normally really exciting or, the, or the, the, the spectators or whoever's watching, they always come up and talk about it and say, oh my gosh, this is really neat. But at the end of the day, these are just model airplanes, but they take a lot more room to fly. They take a lot more time to set up and take down at the field. And then I'll talk about that a little bit. And sometimes they can be very complex. Okay, so when you think of, you know, this is a pit side design. When I go to build this one day, this is going to have a massive wingspan. I mean, this is a 60% pits S1. And structurally, 
I need to make sure if I'm going to yank and bank and do lump shell box and that kind of stuff with this airplane, it's not going to fall apart in the air. Okay, it's just that simple. But one day when I build my big mosquito, it's going to have a boatload, a crap load of systems in it. Those systems will ride around in a trailer getting the crap bounced around, out, of, out of the airplane. People don't realize when you build giant scale airplanes, there's a whole nother level of crap that can go wrong with it just bouncing around in a trailer. When I used to have a minivan and I'd throw my couple of 60 or 80 inch airplanes in the back of the minivan, they were riding along just like they're in a child's seat basically. When you build giant scale airplanes, sometimes just getting it to the field and back can damage stuff inside it. So you really as the builder need to make sure you're building an airplane that's not going to fall apart in the back of the trailer. Okay. Another thing to consider about flying giant scale airplanes is how much room you need, the perception. If you fly small airplanes and you fly your giant scale airplane to look like it's the same size in the air, you're probably another 150 yards out. Does that mean you're over a neighborhood? You're over a soccer field? Do you really know how far out you're flying? So the thing is, is that when you think about the way the AMA looks at this, there's some implications of liability. So we all know that we have um, our, our homeowner's insurance. And that insurance covers us on an awful lot of stuff. I mean, when you crash a model airplane, in theory, your homeowner's insurance will cover that sometimes. Um, I know mine will. I actually, you can go out and actually get supplementary umbrella insurance to cover things that might go wrong. But if it all doesn't pay, then the AMA, which has a secondary insurance, will pay for it. So the thing is, is that if you have an aircraft that's over 55 pounds and you're not part of the AMA and you're not wavered, you're on the own, you're, you are on your own liability wise. When you think about the LMA program, large model aircraft with the AMA, if you're under 55 pounds, you can build your airplane and fly it and do whatever you want. Okay. And I know there's an argument out there that a 55 pound airplane going 100 mile an hour can kill you just as quick as a 100 mile an hour airplane. But nowadays there's this whole thing about lawyers. If I were to take one of my little ARPs, fly it into the side of an airplane, I mean, fly it into the side of a car, the owner would be mad. The owner would be saying, who's paying for it? And I'll say, I'm paying for it, either through my homeowner's insurance or my secondary insurance with the AMA. And they're probably gonna be okay. We'll exchange numbers. But if I take a 188 inch plane and pile it into a car, the guy might take pictures of it. The guy might put it on the internet. Everybody all of a sudden gonna say, oh my gosh, model airplanes are falling from the sky. What if that would have hit a two year old kid and blew him up? Well, that's the reason we want people to be part of the large model aircraft waiver program because those airplanes are scrutinized that the radios shouldn't fail, that we know how to fly them, that we shouldn't let them get out of control, okay? So basically, if you're between 55 pounds and 77 pounds, two ounces, that's called LMA1. And I know I've done a video where I touched upon this, but I really wanna drill this into people, how easy, how easy it is to be part of the LMA program of the AMA. And look, and I know every time I talk about the AMA, I get hate emails. People are like, well, Damon, I'm at this club and all the people are jerks. I agree. One day, the AMA needs to address the jerks that are part of clubs. But let's just for a moment put that aside and forget all the jerks and all the haters. The AMA is one hell of a program. Okay, it really is. I've been a, I'm, I'm a lifetime member. I dumped the thousand or so dollars many years ago, so I would have to quit paying the yearly dues. I am a lifetime pro member because I believe that much in the AMA. Every organization, I'm sure the International League of Bowling people uh, have arguments and haters and all of that. I'm sure once they drink four or five pints of beer and they're bowling and they get into fist fights, it's probably nastier than you being made fun of at an AMA field. But let's push all of that aside for a minute and just talk about when you're flying a plane over 55 pounds, what are your responsibilities? And how easy is it to get the waiver? Okay, so if you're that 55 pounds, 77 pounds, two ounces, 
If you build the airplane, you assemble the airplane, you're going to do your own self-inspection. You're going to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork, which is part of that document 520A, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And you're, you're basically going to self-certify that that airplane has been, meets the document, all the check marks that are in the document. And if you don't lie, that airframe is probably going to be much safer than many of the models we fly because we need to scrutinize it a little bit. And then you go to a flying field and you get a contest director to witness you do three takeoff and landings or whatever is spelled out in the 520A document. And then you get a really cool card in the mail and you take pictures of your airplane, send it, send it into the AMA. You get a really cool card. And on that card, it will have your name, your LMA number, I mean your AMA number, and you will have saying that your aircraft, and let's say it's called the MSL, that's what mine's called, has the waiver and it's good for three years. You can't get any easier than that. Now, when you go to the LMA2, when you're 77 pounds, three ounces or more, that's a lot different. That's the reason I try to keep all my airplanes 77 pounds, two ounces or less. But it's not that much harder. What's going to happen is while you're building the airplane, you're going to reach out to the AMA inspector, have them come and look at your airplane while you're building it to make your spars, your fuselage, your motor mount, all of that is built right. Okay? And keep in mind that 77 three ounces can go up to 125 pounds. That's a massive airplane. Okay? So, and I'm talking only propeller-driven airplanes right now. I'm not talking turbine. I'm not going to even talk about turbine. That's a whole different part of it. Okay? I'm just talking about the average person like me that wants to build giant scale airplanes right now. So if you're LMA1, it's a self-inspection and kind of a self-certification, if, if that's the right word. You do have to have a contest director or an inspector. There's two or three different people can watch you test fly your airplane. And then you're good to go. It's that simple. So why anybody would fly a 62-pound airplane and skirt the AMA, especially if they're an AMA member, to me, it's just kind of obscene. I mean, I don't get it. I don't know why they wouldn't do that. Um, it's not that. It's actually super freaking easy to get your LMA1. I mean, so I get very, I got to be careful how I say this. My anxieties flare when I hear about somebody not wanting to do something that's super, super easy, that's going to protect the hobby. I mean, they're going to have insurance on that airplane. If the news were to show up, they'd say, yep, I was LMA1, the sun got in my eyes, or a bird flew into my eyes, or whatever, and I crashed my plane, but I did meet the criteria of the AMA, I'm following all the rules, the insurance is going to pay for it, no harm, no foul. Or, you crash that airplane, and the AMA finds out you didn't get a waiver, they're not going to insure you, the local news gets it that you could have had it, but you didn't have it, so you're a jerk. <laughs> okay, I don't get this, people, why you would be flying a plane over 55 pounds and not get the waiver. It makes no sense to me. So now let's dive into the next part of this and talk about the document 520A. You can just type into Google AMA over 55 document 520-A and you'll find a way to download the PDF. And when you download the PDF, and hang on, let me make this a little bit bigger here. So basically, when you download the PF, the things I want you to notice the biggest here is on page 15, 16, and 17. And this is the builder's declaration, but basically says that you, you confirm that you built the airplane. And uh, I'm sorry, ignore number 16. I don't, oh yeah, you got a permit to fly, but that's not, I don't mean the, tur the uh, turbine permit to fly. Uh, oh, that's up here higher. You get your permit to fly on number 12, page 12. So, I'm sorry, let me back up here. I kind of jumped ahead of myself. So, you have a temporary authorization to fly, which means you've inspected your airplane and you're ready to do the test flight and show them that you're good to go. Then you have a permit to fly that you fi filled out that actually the inspector or the uh, observer will sign. Then you're going to send in your 25 bucks with some pictures of your airplane. Um, then you get back... Um, oh, yeah, you do have to fill out your builder's decoration. Then you have to fill out the checklist for pre-flight in, in, in inspection. And once all of that's done, you'll send it all in, and then you'll get back your nifty little card in the mail. One of the things I want you to think about is when you 
when you start thinking about all these things you've got to kind of check off, I've had people tell me that it's kind of intimidating. And I tell you, I, I get intimidated really easy in life, and none of this intimidated me. This was just super simple, easy. Sure, the very first time I had to go through it, I was like, gosh, am I doing something wrong? But the AMA is awesome to work with. Okay, they're just awesome to work with. You do need to do a little bit of due diligence, and that's what this next page is. You will have to figure out if your servos are big enough for your flying surfaces. Okay, and if you've followed my channel very long at all, you know I've created a little a spreadsheet calculator that will make this super easy to do. But all the math is in this 520-A document. So if you love math, use that. If you need the servo calculator, reach out to me. My email's normally in my videos or it's actually on my YouTube page, my homepage on my YouTube. Um, but I've sent it out to probably 300 people already, this little spreadsheet calculator. And I always warn people, you're, if you screw up the calculator, that's not on me. But you, you've got to prove that you know the size of your servos that they're going to actually fly the airplane. And then you've got this really neat checklist you got to go through. And honestly, I use this checklist almost on every RC model I have when it's applicable. But if you would really go through this checklist on every one of your airplanes, every time you flew... I would almost guarantee you'd be like me. You went 20 years without a crash, okay? And t this year I did have what I called a crash, but everybody makes fun of me because I didn't even hurt the airplane. I flipped it over in grass. But to me, the moment the propeller touches the ground and you get a prop strike, that's a crash. But um, I'm telling you, if you go through this checklist that's part of the 520-A document, um, you are going to be set. So um, what I want to do as I close this video down is just get people to understand that flying giant model airplanes, and if you've seen my other videos, they're easier to fly because you can see them. They're easier to fly because the cube wing loading is normally lower. They are absolutely easy to build because they're so freaking big. You take big old monkey hands like mine, and I can get them in to the... There's no tight spaces on a giant scale airplane. And... Um, you know, so look, everybody, I, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. And, and if, you, if you've been a long time follower of mine, you know, I always try to stay positive. But why anybody wouldn't get the AMA over 55 pound waiver, it's just, to me, doesn't make any sense. You're creating a liability for yourself. You're creating a liability for the hobby. You know, you get CNN or Fox News or one of those guys get a hold that you're flying an airplane and hit a minivan even though there was nobody in the minivan, even though your homeowner's insurance are probably going to pay for the minivan, if the story gets out there that you were breaking rules that were already part of an organization you belong to, it just becomes that, that sensational story that the sky's falling. So, and if you're not an AMA member, and look, and I, I have a lot of these conversations with people that aren't AMA members. I agree there are a bunch of jerks that are AMA members, but there's not many jerks that, that run the AMA. Most of those people are long gone. And quite frankly, I only knew one, and he's retired and I think probably died by now. But um, honestly, the AMA is a kick-ass organization if you give them a chance. If you're at a flying field and there's jerks there, you know, you got to do what you do when you're in Walmart and you're standing in line, you know, to buy your, your beer or wine. Just ignore them, you know. I mean, now, if they try to tell you how to fly or they try to do that, you might tell them, hey, look, go pound salt. You know, go eat a steaming turd. Go away. Leave me alone. But um, I'm a massive fan of the AMA and I'm a huge fan of the over 55 rule uh, or waiver because we need it. Because we don't want the government regulating us. We want to self-regulate our hobby. Okay? So, as usual, have an awesome day. I always end these talking about kids and flying model aircraft. If you see a 16-year-old and you hate drones, you hate helicopters, you hate quads, and you tell the 16-year-old, oh, you should be flying a P-40 like I do, they really don't care. Okay, they don't care. Be positive towards the youth in model aviation. We need to embrace 
anybody, if they're 10 years old, 15 year olds, I don't care if you got 10,000 hours in your P40 that weighs 400 pounds and you never fly it and you've got a 1965 lawn chair that you sit in and tell everybody what they're doing wrong, you are the poison to our hobby. <clears throat> Go play golf or chase that ball around for three hours. Leave the youth alone. I've had a lot of young people reach out to me and say, I won't join an AMA club because everybody there is jerks. I fly on a dirt road behind my house. <clears throat> Number one, it's awesome that you belong to AMA. Number two, it's awesome you got a dirt road behind your house. <coughs> Excuse me. But number three, it's really sad that you can't belong to that club because everybody's jerks. Okay? A lot of people don't like creative personalities. A lot of people don't like people who invent their own things. A lot of people, for some reason, don't like people who succeed. You know, we live in a world right now that if you're really smart and really intelligent, you're, you're, you're almost treated, I mean, you're treated poorly. I see it all the time. If you want to build your own airplane out of foam and use um, uh, hot melt glue and you want to just spray it with some bright orange like marker paint you put on the highway and fly it, I think that's freaking cool. But I actually know a couple of people that would say, oh, that's stupid. Why would you do that? I actually had somebody, I'm 60 years old, tell me I'm stupid for why would I detail my big airplanes if they're not replicas of real airplanes? And I'm like, what? Why would you take the MSL-2 and put a two-row radial in it? Why would you do all that neat detailing on an airplane that's not a replica of a real of, of another airplane, like a P-47 or a Thunderbolt or whatever. And I'm like, number one, who in the, f who cares what you think? I If I detail my airplane so it looks like conceptually a real airplane, why would you care? And let's see what you build. You know, are you building awesome stuff that everybody's like, ooh, it's great. Are you building a steaming pile of crap? So if you're young and you've got these haters, just keep going forward. Just keep piling. Ignore them. Chances are one day you'll be a CEO or something of a tech company and their kids will be the janitor. And I shouldn't say that. I apologize because janitors are just as important as any part of the team. So I probably should bleep that out, but I'm not because if you know me, I love everybody. And, you know, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go a long time, you need a team, okay? I don't know who wrote that. I don't think it was Darwin. So look, everybody, have an awesome day. Sorry for getting so chatty. And um, please, if you're over 55 pounds and you belong to the AMA, get the waiver. And if you're old and you don't like kids, quit flying model airplanes. Just go away. Take care, everybody. Be cool and rock on. See you next time. Bye.